Hi everyone, my name is Matt Schallert and today I'm here to talk to you about using local persistent volumes in production. This talk is kind of supposed to be everything I wish I knew about local volumes when getting started with them. I found that there's a lot of great information out there about local volumes, but it's kind of spread throughout various places such as the Kubernetes docs, uh, blog posts or external repos. And so I'm hoping that this can kind of be a helpful a holistic overview. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Chronosphere. Chronosphere is a hosted metrics and monitoring platform, uh, particularly built for large scale, high throughput use cases. So you can imagine that we care a lot about disk performance, uh, performance cost trade-offs and similar that we'll talk about later. Chronosphere is built on top of M3, which is an open source metrics and uh, monitoring platform that we are also maintainers of. And before working at Chronosphere, I was an SRE at Uber, where I worked on the in-house metrics team there. So let's jump right into it. What are local persistent volumes? Local persistent volumes are a feature of Kubernetes that combine two potentially familiar topics, and they're both kind of right there in the name. The local part of local persistent volumes refers to local disks. Local disks are something that are offered in some form or another on most major cloud providers. Um, the general idea is that they are fast disks that are attached directly to the host, uh, the server hosting your virtual machine. This is in comparison to typical remote storage offerings, which are uh, usually offered as a service. They go out over the network. Uh, in this case, since local disks are directly attached to the node, you get significantly better performance uh, and as well as more consistent performance. So the tail latencies you observe will be more predictable than with something like remote disks that have to go out over the network. However, since local disks are attached directly to the node, the data only persists for the lifetime of the instance. So this means that if your instance uh, is terminated or there's some sort of host maintenance, uh, you, may, you might lose all the data on that local disk. However, although there's this downside of the data only persisting for the lifetime of the instance, uh, the benefit is that because the disks are attached directly to the host, you get this significantly better performance and at a reduced cost. Um, and we'll take a look at kind of what exactly that performance and cost differences are. Um, but because of all of this, local disks are better suited for kind of a narrower range of use cases than the more general uh, remote disks. And we'll also discuss that in more detail. But first, let's just take a look. How much better is the performance that we're talking about? So these numbers examine GCP's local SSDs op less local SSD offerings since uh, they publish their numbers pretty clearly and it's easy to take a look at them. AWS and Azure both have uh, similar, if not better, relative performance and cost numbers that we're talking about here. So um, the same uh, benefits kind of apply across multiple providers. And if you're curious, the CockroachDB Cloud Report kind of breaks down these uh, storage characteristics across a variety uh, more dimensions than we're just looking at here. But even still, uh, so on GCP, local SSDs can offer between seven and 12 times better uh, read and write IO operations per second compared to uh, the fastest equivalent remote, remote disk offering. Uh, the throughput stats are also uh, dramatically better. So you can get uh, over twice as much read throughput and uh, roughly 1.7 times write throughput compared to any given uh, persistent disk. So because of this balance of uh, IO performance and write throughput, local SSDs typically are suited for more kind of random read and write use cases. Um, but in any, in any case, uh, these numbers are, you know, obviously the performance here is significantly better than just using remote disks. Um, but the real benefit of all this is that in addition to being uh, more performant, local disks are also much cheaper than, uh, than remote storage. So in GCP's case, local SSD storage will cost eight cents per gigabyte, whereas uh, remote disks, the fastest remote disk offering will cost uh, 17 cents per gigabyte. The persistent volume as, uh, part of local persistent volumes refers to persistent volumes in Kubernetes that you might be familiar with. Uh, 
Uh, so local, local persistent volumes kind of combine these two topics. But first, let's take a look at uh, kind of some of the, the behavior characteristics of persistent volumes in Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, a persistent volume is a resource that represents some sort of remote store or some sort of storage resource, uh, you know, storage that can be concretely mounted in, uh, for, with a pod and read or written to, read from or written to. And a persistent volume claim is the claim that binds a persistent volume to a given pod. Uh, so a pod will be, or a persistent volume claim will have a pod that can uniquely use it. Um, that persistent volume claim will bind it to some persistent volume resource. Kubernetes ensures that your pod is mounted with the, store, uh, with the storage backing its persistent volume claim. This typically happens by uh, first attaching your persistent volume to a node that your pod is running on and then making uh, that attached persistent volume available to the pod itself. However, for a long time with persistent volumes, there was kind of this assumption that storage could just move around with pods. So say your pod was running on node A and it had some persistent volume attached to it. Uh, if node A failed, Kubernetes would take care of rescheduling your pod onto say node B, and it would be able to attach that same persistent storage to the new pod or to the same pod on a new node. But local volumes kind of uh, local disks rather kind of violate this assumption. So, you know, there's this assumption that storage could move along with the pod from node to node, just like Kubernetes can kind of schedule your pod on any node. Um, so this is kind of in conflict with some of these properties that we've talked about, about local volumes, where they're tied to the lifetime of an instance. So uh, in this case, if the, your pod is running on some node and it has local storage attached to it, and that node fails, Kubernetes can't just move that disk to a new node as you can't just detach a physical disk to attach directly to a host machine and move it somewhere else. Um, similarly, you wouldn't actually want Kubernetes just rescheduling your pod, even if it could, if it was using a local volume. Uh, so this is you know, outside of the case of node failures, so just in normal operations, if your pod was running on node A and had some local volume attached to it, and your pod was suddenly rescheduled onto node B, your pod would actually have lost all of its data as all that, as all that data is stored on the local volume attached to node A. So if Kubernetes rescheduled your pod, suddenly you've lost all your data. So how can local volumes work? Um, rather than solving just for the use case of local volumes, the Kubernetes community solved a more general problem uh, and, or came up with a more general solution and that's called topology aware volume provisioning. So what this means is whereas previously um, when a persistent volume claim was created, a uh, persistent volume would be attached or would be provisioned uh, pretty immediately after. Now, when a persistent volume claim is created, it actually waits for uh, the first pod that's going to use that uh, use that persistent volume claim before uh, deciding where to schedule both the pod and the persistent volume. So this means that the scheduler can take into account both uh, the pod's affinity requirements as well as the storage's requirements. And this helped not only with the problem of local volumes, but also with the problem of uh, multi-zone storage in Kubernetes, even with remote storage. So previously, there was a behavior where uh, say you were running a regional Kubernetes cluster and you scheduled a pod in zone A, your storage could have actually gotten provisioned in zone B. And then suddenly your pod wouldn't be able to use that storage because they were in different zones. So by solving for topology aware volume provisioning, Kubernetes solved for both uh, this use case of multi-zone storage as well as local disks. And this is kind of something we frequently see in the Kubernetes community is rather than taking an immediate problem and solving just that narrow use case, kind of figuring out a more uh, general solution that works for multiple problems. So under the hood, persistent volumes are, uh, are, are now have a field called node affinity on them. And this is similar to the node affinity terms you might see on a pod. So this allows the persistent volume to express um, requirements for where it's scheduled. So 
In the case of a local volume, maybe it can only be scheduled on a certain node. Or in the case of zonal storage, it can only be scheduled on nodes in a given zone. So how do you get started using local volumes? What are kind of some of those day one operations? Well, to get up and running with uh, local volumes, in order to provision them, there's a tool called the local static provisioner. So with the local static provisioner, you take care of mounting disks at a certain path on your node. You'll point the provisioner at that path and the provisioner will pick up all of the uh, disks that are mounted and turn them into Kubernetes persistent volume resources. Additionally, the provisioner will take care of lifecycle tasks such as uh, wiping the disk before and after it's mounted uh, or when the persistent volume, or sorry, wiping the disk um, when the persistent volume claim is deleted or the disk is first provisioned, kind of some of those uh, lifecycle tasks that mimic the behavior of uh, you know, new storage being attached. In order to first use local storage, you'll create a storage class dedicated to local storage. Um, so this just pretty much specifies a type of storage that you'll attach or that you'll use with your workloads. And then in your various workloads that you're using disks for in the persistent volume claim templates, uh, rather than just, or rather than specifying uh, a remote storage or not specifying a storage class, you'll just specify the storage class that uh, you created dedicated for local disks. And that's it. You create a storage class, you move all of your workloads to it, and you have 10x faster storage at half the cost. Um, if only, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, unfortunately, because of some of these properties that we've discussed, local disks do behave very differently than uh, regular persistent volumes that you might be used to. So safely using them requires more planning and kind of operational experience. So what are some of these uh, day two operations that you, know, you might have to take into account these differences in behaviors? Uh, the first one that we'll look at is what happens during node failures. So one of the promises of Kubernetes is that nodes can fail and Kubernetes will help your applications be more resilient by rescheduling your workloads on different nodes and kind of abstracting away these failures for you. Additionally, Kubernetes will not just go randomly deleting your data as that, that wouldn't really be helpful uh, from like an orchestration perspective or any perspective. However, both of these th uh, behaviors combined means that if a node fails and that local persistent volume no longer exists, the pod using it will be stuck. So this is because, you know, as Kubernetes won't just delete your data, um, if a pod was using local storage, that local storage is no longer available, Kubernetes won't reschedule it because that would mean bringing up that same pod uh, with local, with, without any data, or sorry, won't reschedule it without manual intervention. So in order to allow this pod to be rescheduled, you have to delete the persistent volume claim and then a new, it, that pod will be rescheduled with a new persistent volume attached to it. Um, and this means that unless you automate it, this is a manual operation. However, at the same time, automating it means that you're automating kind of the deletion of data. So you kind of have to take some care with this. Uh, another kind of day-to-day -day operation that you'll have to take into account uh, is how you handle backups and restore of your data. So with remote disks, you might be used to uh, snapshot and restore, which is a pretty popular uh, kind of disaster recovery mechanism offered on most cloud providers. So with snapshot and restore, you can just take point in time snapshots of your remote disks at any time and uh, bring up new copies of the remote disks um, with, uh, with all the data from that snapshot. And this is kind of helpful, you know, if you were to accidentally corrupt your data or delete something, kind of just being able to go back to any point in time and recover that data. However, there is no snapshot functionality for local disks on any cloud provider. Um, additionally, there's kind of, as we talked about earlier, since uh, local disks are tied to the lifetime of an instance, there are few to no guarantees about the availability of that uh, local disk. So, your, uh, in most cloud provider documentation, it'll talk about some of the caveats of using local storage. Uh, 
but the bottom line is that they all kind of say, you know, you can't really depend on that data always being there because if there is a node maintenance or a maintenance event on the host machine or uh, some wider maintenance event or a node failure, um, that local disk might be uh, might no longer be available. So this means that you are responsible for uh, backing up any data that's stored on local disks. One pattern that can help here is uh, a sidecar pattern with, you know, uh, for backups. So you can have some pod that runs alongside your app and copies all of your data up to an object store on, uh, you know, some sort of regular interval or some other durable remote storage. And uh, finally, it's also worth talking about cluster upgrades. So uh, hopefully you're keeping your clusters up to date, but the way that uh, cluster upgrades typically work on most cloud offerings is that uh, they're done by replacing nodes one by one with a node with a new version. So this is compared to say replacing, uh, where rather than upgrading a single node in place, uh, your cloud provider will just iterate over your nodes and kind of replace them with uh, nodes with the new version. However, this would be problematic to do with local disks. So you can imagine if uh, you were using local volumes with your nodes and your cloud provider started just swapping out those nodes one by one, uh, you would also be deleting all of your local, dis uh, all of your local data Additionally, even if you didn't really care about the data on disk, say you were using uh, local volumes for purely ephemeral use cases, um, you would still have the problem where these pods were stuck and couldn't be rescheduled because as we mentioned previously, unless you delete that volume claim binding that pod to that storage, uh, Kubernetes won't reschedule the pod. So a safer solution here is to instead kind of preemptively evacuate your node pools. So for example, if you were going to upgrade uh, you know, node A, um, you might first manually or through some automation delete that volume claim, allow that pod to be rescheduled on a new node, and then actually allow that node to be upgraded. Um, and again, this kind of requires both some planning and some automation. Um, but once you've migrated pot your workloads that are using local volumes away from your nodes that are you're going to upgrade, then you can either safely upgrade them or just tear them down. So we've kind of talked about some of the things to consider when using local volumes and kind of these uh, subtleties, but that doesn't mean you should just avoid them. Because as we mentioned earlier, if used properly, you can get these dramatically uh, improve store this dramatically improved storage performance at a reduced cost. Um, so we're kind of going to look at some use cases or patterns for using local volumes that are a better fit given uh, these given their characteristics. So first let's talk about something that might not be a good fit. Um, Local volumes are not a good fit for things like single primary instances of a database or some other application. For example, say you were only running uh, one replica or one instance of MySQL on your, in your cluster using uh, local volumes, which arguably you wouldn't want to do with remote storage anyway, but uh, let's take a look at with that with local volumes. So say there was some sort of node failure um, and the, now suddenly your MySQL pod would be unavailable. And since it's a single instance, you would uh, you know, be failing all reads and writes to it. Um, additionally, even if you were to delete that volume claim and allow that MySQL pod to be rescheduled to a different node, suddenly it would come up with a new empty disk and you would have lost all of your data. So a better fit for using local volumes would be workloads that already have uh, kind of like fault tolerance and replication built in. An example of this would be Kafka, which allows you to write uh, or to set a replication factor and then handles distributing your data. So in this case, uh, say you had a client running that was sending writes to Kafka, uh, those writes would be replicated across three instances on three different nodes with three different local volumes. 
This means that even if one of your instances fail, your overall uh, availability isn't impacted as there are still two replicas to store the data. Um, but more importantly, since when this instance fails, you lose the data on local disk, uh, when a new node or when a new pod comes up to replace it on a new node, it will have an empty disk. Um, but since the or since you're using an application uh, that can handle copying data, uh, Kafka will stream the data that it's supposed to own from the uh, nodes that remained available and reconstructed state. So overall, you wouldn't have uh, lost any data, although you you know temporarily it was unavailable. Um, but overall, you wouldn't have lost any data and your overall uh, application availability wouldn't have been impacted. So generally speaking, these workloads that are fault tolerant and handle replication for you will make it easier and safer, will be easier and safer to run on local volumes. Um, and again, especially if they handle this, uh, you know, some of this uh, replication and other behavior under the hood, uh, you won't have to build as much operational tooling on top of it. There are a few other use cases that can uh, take advantage of local disks pretty well outside of just databases. So some data processing pipelines can use disk as kind of a spillover cache for data. Um, so you know these cases where the data on disk is purely ephemeral um, can be really helpful because again, you know if you're using it for some sort of local cache uh, and like data processing, you don't really need that storage like stored on a remote store and replicated for you because you can lose it at any time. Additionally, there are some databases that uh, can use you know, certain um, paths for just incoming writes or buffering incoming writes and then have a, or use a different storage path for uh, long-term data storage. So uh, for example, Cassandra can do this. Um, this, and so in this case, you could do something like have incoming writes buffered to uh, a local disk and use a remote disk for uh, long-term storage. Again, you wouldn't want to do this unless you were replicating the data across multiple instances, but this would mean that um, for that more performance sensitive use case of uh, kind of committing incoming writes, you uh, can just use a local disk. And even if that instance it, uh, fails and is rescheduled, you only lost from that one instance a short uh, period of time so or a short period of data. So this is kind of a best of both worlds scenario. So to recap some of the themes we've talked about, you know, since local volumes present kind of a departure from typical operations that you're used to, you really do have to consider the impact it will have on both your workloads and your day-to-day -day, uh, operations. And you'll likely have a smoother experience getting started and running further in production if you at least start with these workloads that are kind of like already fault tolerant or uh, purely ephemeral as they'll require you to let build less uh, operational tooling on top of that. Your cloud provider will likely document the behaviors that you should expect with local disks. And this knowledge combined with how local persistent volumes in Kubernetes work is going to uh, be pretty key to painting a better picture of what to expect in day-to-day -day operations. So um, those are both two, or both your cloud provider's documentation and some of the, the Kubernetes resources are uh, good things to kind of absorb. Um, and in addition to some of the practices we've talked about here, there is a really helpful best practices doc in the local static provisioner repo that gets into kind of more of the uh, nitty gritty details of mounting disks and everything. Uh, these are just some helpful resources that I've referenced so far, uh, and I'll post these in these, or these will be in the slides that are posted afterwards. And that's about all I have. Thank you all for joining, and I hope that this was helpful. Um, like I said, we, uh, I work at Chronosphere and we have a virtual booth here where we would love to talk further with you. Um, and you can come see a demo of the platform that I mentioned. And if anyone is available, or sorry, I'll be available later if anyone wants to talk about uh, just local disks or any of the topics we've talked about or kind of have any further questions. Um, and with that, I will get into the Q&A.